In this video, we'll demonstrate why critics need to stop using the Syriac argument from silence. Reminder to hit the subscribe button below to stay up to date on our Daniel series as new videos come out, and also look in the description below for a couple links to some critical articles just to understand their position a little bit better. Critics and late daters basically have to maintain that Daniel never really existed. The main way that they tried doing this is by saying, if Daniel was such a famous prophet, why isn't he mentioned by Jesus ben Syriac? Now, if you don't know who Syriac was, don't worry about it. But one thing that you should notice right off the bat is that this is, again, another argument from silence. Again, are all arguments from silence bad? No, but we need to evaluate this one just to see if there's any merit to it. Looking at our timeline, the objection is raised out of the early 2nd century BC with a statement that says, Daniel is not mentioned by Jesus ben Syriac in the book of Syriac, also known as Ecclesiasticus. The Old Testament was basically written over a course of a thousand years, with Malachi closing off the canon around 425. Then, the two centuries following Alexander the Great's conquest, you have the Deuterocanonical books being written mainly in Greek, and it's in this period that the book of Syriac is also written in. If you were to open up a Catholic Bible, you would see that Syriac is the 26th book in their Old Testament, and seven other Deuterocanonical books are also included in blue as well. The Catholic and Orthodox churches share these same seven, with the Orthodox Church also including three more books and a psalm as well. And if you were to look in the Ethiopian Old Testament, you would see that they also include the first Enoch and Jubilees in theirs. The relevant ones for us are with 1st and 2nd Maccabees and Syriac, as Syriac is dated prior to the Maccabean Revolt, and Maccabees are both written shortly thereafter. So you can kind of think of the Maccabean Revolt as kind of like a dividing line in this authorship debate. Now that you have that timeline in your head, we can dive into the Syriac and see what their argument is all about. Syriac starts off saying, Whereas many and great things have been delivered to us by the Law and the Prophets, and by others that have followed their steps, for the which things Israel ought to be commended for learning and wisdom, and whereof not only the readers must needs become skillful themselves, but also they that desire to learn be able to profit them which are without, both by speaking and writing. So the Law and the Prophets here are referred to as accepted scripture, with him saying that his readers need to be able to teach others so that they will be benefited in the same manner. So his point's very simple. We all need to know our Bible and be able to teach others about it. Now, one of the things about Syriac is that it's a very large book. It has 51 chapters, and after the prologue, you can see that he goes on for 43 chapters of giving advice and wisdom to his readers, which is why the book is also called The Wisdom of Syriac. Then in chapters 44 through 50, he goes into a hymn for his ancestors of Israel's past, who did great deeds, and then he closes out the book with a prayer. It's in the hymn section that we need to look, because this is where the critic's argument comes from. So let's dive right in. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers that became the father of us. The Lord has wrought great glory by them through his great power from the beginning. Now it's after this point that he just goes on listing a bunch of key Old Testament figures, so let's just see who he mentioned in a list. He first started off mentioning Enoch from Genesis 5 to the United Kingdom mother Solomon for the first three chapters. Then after this, he goes on for three chapters mentioning a few kings, some of the major prophets, then Job, the 12 minor prophets, and the boys who led the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple after Cyrus's decree. After this, he just mentions Enoch once again, but he also included Joseph, Shem, Seth, and even Adam. So in a broad stroke, you basically have the Old Testament period all being covered from Genesis to Nehemiah, so the critic points to the time where Christians say Daniel should be dated and asks, well, then where's Daniel? We see Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but why not Daniel? If he was such a great contemporary prophet of theirs, shouldn't he be mentioned? So it seems like a pretty good point that they raise, and some questions that they pose to us. But let's make it even worse for us. Because if you were looking at the section about Jeremiah, you see that Syriac praises him for his prophecies given beforehand that came true. And earlier he did the same thing with Isaiah, so it's not like Syriac has a problem giving credit to prophets for their prophecies from God, so why didn't he just do Daniel as well? So from this, the critic then declares that, since Daniel is missing, he therefore didn't exist because Syriac would have included him. 
Now it's this last part that you need to have your ears alerted for because making this type of claim is just a giant presumption. Let's just think about what they're basically declaring here. The critic is saying that if CIREC didn't mention someone, then they therefore didn't exist. So that's what their whole argument from silence here is about. And here's really the counter challenge to this. Then what about all the other Old Testament figures that weren't mentioned by Sirach as well? If you look at the earlier list, you don't see Deborah and Barak, Gideon, or Samson from the Book of Judges, you know, and they only saved the entire nation a few times collectively. And also you don't see King Asa and Jehoshaphat, who were also called good kings, but they weren't mentioned by Syriac. And what about the prophet Jonah to Nineveh, or Mordecai and Esther, who saved the Jewish race from being annihilated by King Xerxes? So by the same logic, should we throw out the book of Judges, Jonah, and Esther, or cast them as late authorship just because Sirach didn't mention them? But regardless of that kind of counter, they'll likely just still hold to their viewpoint. So really what we need to do is be able to show outside references to Daniel that authenticate his historicity. And the first place that we're going to start is 1 Maccabees 2. If you look at the authorship timeline, we have 1 Maccabees being dated after 134 BC, but probably prior to 124 because it's during this time that 2 Maccabees is dated as well. So in verse 249, he says, And in the days of Matthias drew near that he should die, and he said to his sons, Now have pride and rebuke gotten strength in a season of overthrow and of wrath of indignation. And now, my children, be you zealous for the law and give your fathers lives for the covenant of your fathers. And call to remembrance the deeds of our fathers, which they did in their generations, and receive great glory and an everlasting name. So like Syriac, the author is going to remind the people of past icons to bolster their confidence that God is still watching over Israel. In verse 52, he mentions Abraham, then Joseph in 53, and then he goes on mentioning Phineas, Joshua, Caleb, David, and Elijah. So you can see that he's doing a similar recounting that Syriac did in his book. But he goes on mentioning just a few more characters, and in verse 59 he says, Hananiah, Azariah, Michelle believed and were saved out of the flame, which we know is a direct reference to chapter 3 of Daniel. Now, the icing on the cake is, in verse 60, he says, And Daniel, for his innocency, was delivered from the mouth of lions, which comes right out of chapter 6. So here's the ancestors the author listed, along with the Old Testament books that they correspond to. And also remember the title above that comes from verse 51 that says that these guys came from their generations. Then at the bottom you can see the Old Testament time periods from the patriarchs to the exile and the return, and that Daniel and his friends fall within the exile period in 605 to 539 BC. Yes, I can already hear the reply to this. Well, first Maccabees is written after the Maccabean revolt. Okay, well let's take a bigger picture of this whole thing. You have the book of Syriac being written somewhere between 200 and 175 BC. Then you have the Maccabean revolt taking place in 167 through 160. Then thereafter you have 1st Maccabees being written about 134 to 124 BC. Well, what does this mean in terms of the authorship debate? Well, what it means is that there is now only a 30 to 40 year narrow window that the Daniel could have been written in and popularized to the point as seen as canonical on the same level as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Because 1st Maccabees just declared and associated Daniel and his friends to the likes of Abraham, Joshua, David, and Elijah. So I hope you're starting to see how preposterous this really sounds, because the critic is claiming that these anonymous Jewish authors somehow forged the book together, got it to spread like wildfire, and fooled everybody into thinking that it was an inspired work from the 6th century BC, yet nobody ever called that into question. Because for the next 300 years, going through the New Testament all the way through the 2nd century AD, when Jewish rabbis forged the Talmud together, they all just kept on referring to Daniel and the characters within it as real people from the 6th century BC. So you really have to declare that tens of thousands of people just held to the same lie or somehow were all duped by anonymous Jewish authors from four centuries before this. But let me make it just a little bit worse for you. Because there is one person in the New Testament who specifically refers to Daniel as a real person. And he is found in Matthew 24, 15 and Mark 13, 14. And there he says in both of them, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And we know that this is citing from 927 through, uh, excuse me, 927, 1131, and 1211. But who said this? It was Jesus. And so you need to now declare another thing. Is Jesus also a liar? Or is he just an idiot who didn't know that Daniel was really a forgery from two centuries before this? Now outside of 1st Maccabees, Jesus, and the Talmud, we have another historian on our side, and his name is Josephus. In Antiquities of the Jews, Book 11, Chapter 8, he covers the period of Alexander the Great's conquest that came near to Jerusalem. He states, And when Jadua the high priest understood that Alexander was not far from the city, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of the citizens. And when the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that followed him thought that they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse of it happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance, in white garments. The scene here is that the Jewish priests are fearing that Alexander's army is going to march into town and rob the treasure out of the temple and likely torture them to death because this is what they've been doing to everyone else as well. So their plan is to take a leap of faith and determine to go out and meet Alexander's army to hopefully prevent this by wearing white garments as a sign of peace. But they also brought something with them as well. And when the book of Daniel was showed him wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. Let's be honest here. Josephus is clearly dating the book of Daniel well before the Maccabean revolt. So the question is simple. Is Josephus making this whole story up, hence a liar, or was it a story that was actually true that was passed down to him so that he was able to record it? You know, but the funny thing here is that Josephus is actually doubling down on the historicity of Daniel because earlier in, at the end of book 10, in the final two chapters, he basically retold the whole book of Daniel. And if you don't believe me on that, you can just go read this on, you know, like Project Gutenberg at any time for free. So we have Josephus giving his support to the early authorship of Daniel in his Antiquities of the Jews. But regardless of even showing somebody like Josephus as evidence towards the early authorship date, they'll probably just say, oh, well, that's still dated after the Maccabean Revolt. Okay, fine. Well, here's your left hook then. Daniel is also found in the book of Ezekiel three times. Because if you were to look in there, you would see in chapter 14, verse 12, it says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and cut off man and beast from it. And in verse 14 he says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Then in the following verses, Ezekiel refers to Noah, Daniel, and Job as these three men twice more. And then he finishes off this section in verse 20, naming them again each. And then finally, in chapter 28, he says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from you. This is clearly referring to the same Daniel as referred to in chapter 14. So we have Ezekiel referring to the prophet Daniel five times in the 6th century BC. So how can critics possibly get around this one? Or really, what lame excuse do they offer? Well, they'll say that the Daniel being referred to here by Ezekiel is just the mythological Canaanite sage Dan El, who appears in the Ugaritic tablets in the legend of Akka, son of Dan El. So, since Daniel and Dan El sound so familiar, they must be referring to the same person. Here's why this claim is beyond stupid, and I'm not sorry for saying it that way. Ezekiel's whole ministry was condemning Israel and the priesthood for their idolatry to pagan gods. So you really think he's going to record Yahweh giving praise to a Canaanite pagan hero from the 14th century BC? 
Oh yeah, they just might breeze right over that fact that he's a Canaanite from the same period of Joshua's conquest of who? Oh yeah, the Canaanites. And that's why I'm giving each one of these arguments their own video, because critics are not going to exposit on all the details. So is Syriac's silence on Daniel really good proof for the late authorship of Daniel? No. But now you're fully aware that 1st Maccabees wasn't silent, Jesus wasn't silent, Josephus wasn't silent, and let's be real honest with ourselves, Ezekiel is clearly mentioning the prophet Daniel that is found in the Bible, and not some Canaanite pagan hero from the 14th century. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to look in the description for the link for the articles on the critical view, because we'll be going into chapter 2 next and the prophecies start rolling in. In the meantime, stay salty.